welcome to The Truth in His Heart. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today I am super privileged to welcome fellow Baltimorean, fellow glasses wearer, <laughs> um, you know, filmmaker, conceptual artist, cultural worker, originally from West Baltimore. Please welcome Nia Hampton. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And um, as I touched on in the intro, um, thank you for wearing your glasses. I always point out the fellow, <laughs> the spectacled individuals, you know, mm -hmm. they used to give us a little, you know, a little shade. Yours are much more fashionable than mine. <laughs> These are new. I'm so excited. These have really changed my whole I'm like, wow, I'm fine, huh? Like, <laughs> it's a uh, it's a website called Z Zelo, I believe. Yeah. Like, I got two pairs for like $150, and my regular eye doctor was trying to charge me $300 for just one pair. So here, here's the thing, I I, I feel like I, I feel like I I have three pairs of glasses that I wear. My eyes have gotten a lot better, and I think it's just as my my partner says to me, she was like, you take your glasses off, your eyes disappear, and I was like, this is offensive. <laughs> But I have three pairs of glasses and I have one that's kind of circular. And I was like, I wear those to opening. So I go to galleries so I can look like I'm part of the scene. <laughs> I wear these when it's business time and the other ones are like my regular, I'm just a regular dude kind of glasses. So yeah, mm -hmm. business time. Yeah, no, glasses are on trend again. But I think that's because everyone, post COVID, we're all a lot less healthy. And so there are certain, I'm serious, there are certain like disability markers that are just going to become cool. Yeah. Because it's going to be so, one, it's a market that you can get assistance for this disability. Because technically wearing a glasses is, is disability. Like if, if for whatever reason, the things that people who go through with diabetes, if that yeah. was to affect folks who wear glasses, mm -hmm. society would collapse. So I think in the next like decade or so, it's going to be cooler to see like you'll see fashionable canes and like all of these kind of like things that were like, oh, what is this? It's going to be, I'm serious. I see it. No, I hear you. And, you know, I've seen a few a few more people like paying attention in those areas uh, because it's like you had time to, you know, 2020 and all you had sort of time to take a moment and kind of reset and really look at like, oh, I should be concerned about my health. I should be looking into these things. And, you know, some people going on that sort of weight loss journey, some people waiting a little later and, and all of these sort of different things that make up sort of what we were numb to for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. That's my thinking. Um, but as as we we get started, as we sort of open it up, I gave the the cut and paste, you know, sort of introduction. So I want to give you the mm -hmm. space to introduce yourself in your own words. And I think it's a lot of power in that. You know, we we have those artist statements, we have those bios, and a lot of times it's just like, oh, okay, this is cool, or this might not really reflect who the person is. It's like who the work, what the work is, but not necessarily who the person is. So I'm gonna give you space to introduce yourself. Um, you know, I'm in my, I'm ending my first year of a MFA program at UMBC into media and digital arts, and we write artist statements every semester. And artist statements are almost like dating profiles, or you know, <laughs> or the bios of your social media. It's like actually so hard to write about who you are specifically as an artist, because you're always, I mean, maybe you're always changing or maybe you're always discovering. Um, so that's my preface for this attempt. I think some lines from my more recent artist statements included things like, I am a conceptual artist who makes meaning out of familiar mistakes and misrem misrememberings. Um, I use media as a ruse to have an interaction. Um, and I think as I age, I'm becoming a lot more mischievous in my practice, mm -hmm. um, because I take, interestingly enough, I take myself more seriously, but that gives space for me to enjoy whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, so yeah, like that's me. I'm a conceptual artist and I do a whole bunch of stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 like, <laughs> I like the I like the pursuit for like in that balance between like being serious and taking what you do serious, but also being able to have a little mischief. Like um, that's what I what I do in this, you know, like I like to watch how sweat you creative and artist types when it gets down to like the rapid fire questions. I don't give those to you guys just to see like, oh, OK, yeah. Uh huh. That 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 aesthetic of I know my work. It's like, yeah, cool. What about this? <laughs> <laughs> what mm -hmm. about your favorite movie, though? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. So 
in, in thinking of sort of memory, right, I want to go back a little bit to just a fun or impactful memory of your your childhood. Like, you know, you're a fellow Baltimorean. Um, and I think a lot of our creative like inklings kind of start when we're young. And I, I discovered that in doing this podcast for myself. And I was like, nah, that didn't count. And then someone's like, you should really look at that and examine that. So I passed the question to you. Um, I have two. Because, you know, I've had COVID twice now. And so my memory is something that I am aware of because it's not as malleable. That's not the real. It's just not what it used to be. And so I find myself being like, did that happen? Am I making that up? Um, But these specific memories, I feel very confident in the fact that they're real because I've made art about them. And I've told the story over and over and over. Um, So the first memory is the time when my mother was about to audition for the Universe Soul Circus. Um, And that became family lore. It became an inside joke. It became my thesis film in undergrad. It is a film I recently uh, made and I'm raising funds for it right now. Like it is the premise for an entire um, storytelling universe. It's a way to talk about my familiar dynamic without necessarily talking about my familiar dynamic. Um, A second memory I have is of a Murphy bed in my dad's trailer park when he was living in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And I just thought a trailer park was so cool. Like, I, you know, when you're a kid, anything your parents do, you know, to a certain to a certain extent and at a certain age, they're like the coolest things in the world. And I just he had a Murphy bed in a trailer park and the trailer park was Gettysburg. My dad is like from the Bronx, you know, like he's a very cool guy. So like him being in Gettysburg, like literal colonial Gettysburg trailer park, Pennsylvania, like I think Western Pennsylvania, that was just such a striking, like, I don't know if I've ever spent time in a trailer park since, but it definitely made me fond of a certain working class aesthetic. Not that that's not my actual reality, Sure. But being from Baltimore, I don't know that anyone is associating trailer parks with Baltimore. So those are my two core memories. Thank you. So, you know, as as you went back through and you're, you know, talk, you touched on your your current artist statement, right? As it, and I might have to start doing that practice. Like I'm going to start changing minds every quarter or something as far as mm-hmm. what this is, because at one point it had democratized in there. I was like, I don't even use that word, but um, <laughs> but it sounds cool. Um, mm-hmm. As far as your work goes, where, what is your your why? Like, when did you arrive to, you know, you're interested in doing this, you're pursuing this as a, a calling, as a vocation? What was the why there? Um, so I was, um, I am, oh, I'll wait. <laughs> I was born into this, you know, uh, my friend called me a Nepo baby. And I'm just like, I mean, I guess we're poor, but sure, why not? Um, and I've read that black people's cultural and well, I've heard that black people's inheritance is culture, you know, like we unfortunately don't get to inherit like the funds, but we inherit the things that make a culture, the skills, the taste the whatever. And I was just, I happened to be lucky enough to be born into a very artistic family, specifically my mother who got to be an artist. Um, and she fought for that, you know, and it's, It's just been a journey to watch. Um, I think it wasn't necessarily my calling as much as it was me being a good eldest daughter and wanting to spend time with my mom and like, this is what she does for fun. So it becomes fun. Um, And subsequently I became known as a certain type of way. And I'm like, this is just what my, you know, this is what my mother do. This is what we do in my family. This is how we bond. Um, It wasn't until I left Baltimore uh, after graduating from UMBC, I went to school for media and communications uh, because I just, that just felt, feasible um, and practical, but still kind of close to storytelling. I moved to Brazil and I was trying to like teach English and I dyed my hair purple and I got fired from this job that was going to like help me get my visa. And I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And um, suddenly my writing started like taking off. Um, I had always been paid as an artist, but you know, it's relative. Like if you're an artist outside of a major city in a major industry, it's kind of like, mm, you know, you really like doing it for yourself. Um, but living in Brazil and kind of being in a, in a community of like black queer filmmakers who like had their own stuff, they were just coming together and showing stuff. And I had never thought that like, it could be that easy. I'm like, oh, if y'all are doing this, I can do this. Um, so I think spending time abroad in Brazil, Salvador Bahia, Brazil is where I learned that everything that I was doing while it was influenced by my family 
and made possible by my family, I started to kind of say what I wanted to say in my specific way. Um, cause I had fought it. Like I really, like I was, you know, I was just going to be an English teacher, chill, date other artists, support their work. I don't know that I was thinking like, oh, okay, this is what I want to do. This is what it's going to look like. Um, but that was where it started to pay to like be myself in that way, in a major way. I mean, again, I've, I've gotten paid before, but it would be like my first job was an extra on the wire in ninth grade. Nice. <laughs> Which was, it was cool, right? But then, like, the wire leaves and we don't have an industry here. So I'm learning, like, as an artist, like, it matters that you're good. But if you want to be able to stay good, you have to find a way to, like, pay for your life with what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and thank you. Because, you know, I, I got a piece of advice before I move to this next question. I got a piece of advice. You know, you, I, I have conversations with people, especially like, you know, outside of like the, the podcast, I have conversations with it's like outside of the context of the podcast, just like sort of the real post, you know, conversation, conversation, the sort of real, real conversation. And, you know, it's just in the, one of these moments of getting like some some feedback, you know, like and, and, and I'm doing this. And as you were, you were touching on sort of major market, major industry and sort of thinking about that and. I'm doing the education thing and podcasting. So I'm revisiting some of these, these different elements. I'm like, all right, I'm getting this. I'm hearing, oh, you know, this is important. I'm glad that you're doing this and so on. But then this thing that has value and, and so on, storytelling and all of that, you know, it's just like, I don't quite see it. And it's mm -hmm. not like, you know, how when people say, hey, you know, we just discovered you. It's like, I've been around for 15 years, you know, <laughs> overnight success, yeah. right? Yeah. And, trying to figure it out and i was just like got some sort of feedback of just continue being you uh, you're the only mm -hmm. you and i got that from someone who's you know done and been abroad and all of this different stuff and has done a lot of d different interesting work and it's just like that's the thing that sets you aside you know you're doing this you, you whether it be from who you're talking to how you talk to them and just the stories that you find interesting that's the thing that sets you aside from everything else and yeah. When I get those conversations, it's definitely, you know, a reminder. This one was the most recent one. And, you know, it it, it helps to hear that, especially, you know, you think I was thinking about it recently. Man, I'm going to live this boring life and keep this data job that I have. I have a, you know, IT job. <laughs> and, you know, maybe I'll write something here and there. Maybe I'll, you know, talk about my favorite movies in a podcast. But doing this, I think, is important to me and just like kind of falling back in love with that. That why? Mm -hmm. I mean, it. I mean, art is so much more than like a job. It's and that's why I'm an artist and not a creative, because a creative is a person who gets to do creative things for like a living as a job. But an artist is a way of life and an artist is not an artist or an artist doesn't stop being an artist because they're not productive or because they're not wealthy. Like it is just a way of life. There are people whose work you have never seen, but you're, you know, they are artists just from the way that they move and the way that they, you know. And I've just been able to like kind of see a lot of different ways to be an artist. Um, you know, I've seen more successful people and I've seen less successful people. And it, I just, I don't know that the good and bad are like, oh, they're a good artists, they're a bad artists. That is just so irrelevant. It's like, are you still practicing? Do you have a craft? Do you have a relationship to your practice? What does it do for you? What are you learning about yourself? Like when you come at it from that way, it's like you can't really... You can't lose, you know, it, it's helped me just live a beautiful life. Like having an art practice just makes me happy, really. Um, I'm learning in real time all of the other things that comes with like just navigating like a capitalist society. But like I'm an artist, whether I'm drawing or painting or taking pictures or dancing, like I'm just, you know, I'm a person trying to articulate and express my experience earnestly, <laughs> not necessarily to be seen or to be liked. But like, just because if I don't do it, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I thank you. It, that, and that's a good point. It's a good way to kind of go into this, this next question that I have, you, you know, do you have like role models is I'm going to use for lack of a better term, because I'm not feeling particularly articulate in this question, but, mm -hmm. you know, creative, artistic, like role models, writers, artists, filmmakers, what have you. Is there one or, or two that come to mind? And what do you admire about them? I mean, there's so many. I, um, right now, or maybe even like the past five years, the person that has really 
made me think differently about what it is that I want to do uh, is Saida Hartman. And I don't know that folks would like consider her a traditional artist as much as she's like a scholar. But sure. if you read her book or her work, her uh, critical fabulation is a methodology in which she'll take ordinary or found historical documents about black people, women, marginalized folks, and like fill in the blanks. Mm. And her writing is gorgeous. Like I'm not really a, a text heavy scholarly person. I love fiction and I love to really like get lost in work, but she's writing about things that really happened with a voice that is so just artful, you know? And it's, it's this weird blurred line. Like, is this real? Is this fiction? But it's like, does it matter? Right. You know? And so a lot of the work that I'm doing specifically right now, I'm really interested in my own lived experience. So, you know, obviously my mother is a big uh, source of inspiration for me, but she's also a muse. I'm also like literally going through her life and pulling out moments, our life together, really, yeah. and, and speculizing them or fictionizing them or exaggerating them or minimizing them and just like playing with my own memories. Um, I'm inspired by my friends right now. I uh, have a friend, her name is Jade Flower Foster, and she's a phenomenal poet and a dope filmmaker and a screenwriter. Um, who else am I really thinking about? Um, I'm always a fan of Octavia Butler. Like I'm a speculative fiction girl. A lot of the folks that I've met at the Voices of Our Nation's Art Speculative Fiction in 2017, those people are still some of my favorite writers. My friend Joseph Errol Thomas just published his second book or third book. And he just, he's just so honest. It makes me uncomfortable sometimes. Like he's, you know, black people, I think in this country, at some point we have to farm our family for trauma. Like I'm watching my peers and at some point everybody's like, all right, it's time to, you know, point the camera on myself and thus my family. And the things that we decide to share is like, it's like a landmine, you know, like you share the wrong thing and that's the end of a relationship or you share the right thing and you get rich. And it's like, you know, you can't ever really gauge what's appropriate. You kind of have to make those decisions for yourself. And so the, the honesty that his first book took, I really feel, but I always like, I'm always conflicted on just like, why did you have to do this? You know, like, why did you have to share so much of what happened? But I'm grateful he did it. I'm inspired. And in my own work, I'm like, okay, if I'm going to do this, what do I want people to feel? And how do I go about this? Um, but yeah, literally so many people that I know in real life that are just human beings who have found the will to keep making work. Those are my like inspirations. Love it. So I want to go into these like next two questions and I have like the latter third of the pod sort of reserved for sort of the major topic, you know, if you will. Um, let's talk about Black Femme, Black Femme Supremacy Film Festival. Um, let's talk about that a little bit, sort of what was the inspiration behind it and like how has it contribute to, contributed to, changed, added to sort of the local like Black film or local film perspective in Baltimore? So Black Film Supremacy was founded in 2018 and fueled by uh, revenge. <laughs> like I, uh, all I had was revenge and a curator who wanted more events on the weekends of my first art show and a timeline full of other Black film filmmakers who did not have like a pathway to a traditional festival experience. And before then I had been, um, I had gone to the Black Star Film Festival, like I saw it become, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And at the same time I was volunteering at the Maryland Film Festival. And I just, I just, I observed how happy I was to be at a film festival. Like I was just festival time, I'm happy, I'm volunteering, I'm standing, I'm doing all the work, but I'm enjoying it. And that's why I'm like, okay, yeah, I love this stuff. I want to make films. Um, and it seems like the place to kind of figure out how to do that. Uh, so in that spring of 2018, I had my show up, but I was also trying to get like in the festival world, you get like little 250 an hour or 250 for the weekend jobs where you just, they work you to death, but it's great because you get to like meet filmmakers and you get to see the work and da, 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 da. And I wanted to be like a volunteer coordinator or something, you know, that I was all qualified to do, quite frankly. And I interviewed at Maryland Film Festival and they were like drooling over me and just, oh my God, you're so great. Blah, 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 blah. And you know, I didn't get that job. So, <laughs> right. and I was just like, wait a minute, you know, what, what's going on? Um, and I was just like, you know, I'm gonna do my own thing. You know, I already have an upstairs room in Walla Gallery. My curator, Joy Davis, I was her first artist that she used in that space. Um, 
And she was like, yeah, let's get some people in here for more things. And I'm like, what else could I? And she's like, and let's charge people. I'm like, whoa, what could I charge people for that's not already in the gallery? Yeah. And I said, oh, festivals. Because I had been dabbling. Like, I was becoming a little program on the low. I'm good for a recommendation. Um, and I'm an, eldest, I'm an eldest daughter. So I know how to tell people what to do, you know, like in a group setting. So it just happened. I made a Google form asking for films and volunteers. And I got my best friend who I met in UMBC, my creative partner, um, Maya Rodriguez. She made some stuff for me. Um, we got some flyers out. And then I had two people reach out to be volunteers, Hilda Deneje and Somali. Um, and they have been just life changing. It's just funny, like the internet, really. Like, honestly, it was the internet that created this festival because it was so many people who felt the same way as me. You know, it's 2018. That was a that was an interesting time. We were all like, where's our thing? We want our stuff. And uh, we made some stuff and it was just it just continued for a long time and it was a good time. And that's what a festival is about. A festival should feel like a reunion. A festival is just a bunch of people getting together to like enjoy the same things. And in the film world as a black woman, you know, as you go out into it and get more into it, you're like, oh, wow, like we are so it's not that many of us. Right. But because it's not that many of us, we tend to be more accessible. You know, like this festival, I've developed relationships with folks like Felicia Pride, who is a filmmaker and director, screenwriter from Baltimore, super just down to earth and like amazing. Does, does so many things, you know, like these people who are just running and doing it. But also they, they know what it took for them to get there. Right. And I think they understand legacy. And so they're just like, and, and I will say this has been interesting. So like the people who are generous, even in their like fame or bigness of their careers have kind of always been that way. Like Newman Perrier, who made Black and Sexy TV, yeah. film director. Um, she recently donated to my festival. I mean, I'm sorry, to my crowdfunding campaign, but she agreed to come to the festival when we had it at, at the Parkway in 2019. And that's a whole other story how we got to the Parkway after, like all of that. But in 2019, when we ended up hosting the festival at the Parkway, she was our opening night feature and she came in and had a conversation with us and just, you know, because like filmmakers want to watch people watching their things. Right. Um, and she's continued to be just, you can just you just know when people are for the culture. You know when people are doing things to benefit themselves. You know when people have a larger scope, like this isn't about me, I'm one person in a long lineage of folks trying to do this particular art form. And that's what has been my favorite part of this festival. It tends to attract people who are for the culture or the legacy of what it means to be a black femme trying to make films. Thank you. That's, that's, that's great. And um, each of the, the festivals that you've mentioned I've worked with, um, I had a really cool experience working with uh, Black Star. Um, I think last year I worked with the founder, I did an interview with the founder and two filmmakers and both of their films world premieres. So it was like one of nice. those interviews and I was like, yo, this is a responsibility. I can't mess this up. And then, you know. Just, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I love Mayory. Yes. And and they were very interesting films. And um, yeah, and even, you know, it was at that sort of point where I think in a month I did interviews for two, I think two or three film festivals and three, um, three, I think three or four filmmakers that these were all world premieres. I'm like, okay, somebody must be talking, you know, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. so I want to move into this, this sort of next question about, um, you know, projects like, you know, you, you touched on the, the, the program and piece there a little bit. And I see in your background, I see, you know, ballet after dark, I see not about a uh, not about a riot. Um, what sparks your interest in a project, like, is it the challenge? Is it the learning opportunity, collaborators? Is it something else? Like what really says, all right, I need to do this. This makes sense. I would love to work with this person. I would love to work on this project. That's something I'm still figuring out. Um, I think like if we're talking specifically the, like the collaborative aspect of a film, sure. um, what I've learned in filmmaking, because I'm not actually, I'm more of a video artist, like a traditional film. I'm still kind of cutting my teeth in. The film that I just shot this past March is the first time I, that I've had a traditional set budget. People come in. When I shot my mother's planet undergrad, I did all of it by myself. Held the camera. The, the sound was terrible. Added it myself. You know, like, and I'm like, oh, I'm never doing that again. Um, and so, but before this, I got the chance to be on Bean Monet's 
uh, sat as her art director, which was Ballet After Dark. My friend Jovan James, who also graduated from UMBC, they used my house for his location. And so I got to kind of get a very sparse, you know, maybe every six months I'm on someone's set for a day or two um, situation where I got to just experience and see. And, and the thing about a film set is it's its own universe. It's a culture and it's a vibe, you know, like you have to create the type of environment that you want people to show up and do the thing that you're asking them to do. Um, so if I'm deciding to work with a person, it really depends on like the way that a person is asking me. Yeah. A writer's room is similar. It's a culture, but it's not physical. So we're sitting around talking and sharing ideas and, you know, saying this works or this doesn't work, um, as a group or with another person, depending on what you're writing. And then the actual filmmaking, even like working with the DP, like this, this, uh, time around I'm working with my cousin and so you know because he's my cousin <laughs> there are some things that I'm just like some of this we're just going to do um, and before we worked on this he would also I would creative direct with him a lot so we already had a bit of a chemistry um but I'm like okay you're my cousin but also I needed to look like this you know like I need you to like I don't need this I need that like it's just it's a very intimate and unique relationship making art with a, with a person and then in a film setting, it's like a group of people. Yeah. Like, you know, you got to like your gaffer, you got to like, and not only do you like have to like, that, you don't even necessarily have to like people as much as you need to like respect their, what they're doing. And I'm the type of person that when I, when I decide to work with you, I, I'm very like, I want to be hands off. I want to be able to trust that you're going to show up and turn it into whatever it is that I'm choosing you to bring. Because I'm choosing you because I like what you do anyway. I want what you got. Um, I don't want to have to like stand over your shoulder and keep asking about it. And so it's levels. I'm, I'm also learning that I like people who are organized. I like people that are dependable, who are going to show up and do what they say they're going to do without too much other things going on. Um, as a very emotional process based artist myself, I definitely understand how much is required to even show up in the first place. But film sets are about like time and money, you know, like you literally you lose money and you lose time and you won't be able to make the full vision which you want it to be if if everybody don't know they shit. So it's still a little early for me. Um, I think with Not About a Riot, I came onto a project that was already shot. Sure. And so I kind of had to act as a doula for Malika, just like I was the one like, hey, this is important. I, I think you should do something about this. And it turned into like, older sister bullying you know like it was very much like I, and some, sometimes I felt like I cared about it more than her which isn't true but and now that I'm like the the director it's like there's a level of vulnerability mm. that if you don't have people to kind of talk you off the ledge you can like sabotage the process and so being a co-producer or post-production producer I'm almost like a stepfather I'm coming in we already got this thing let's get it where it needs to go and I can kind of walk away. Whereas as a director, and I was thinking about this this morning, because like as a director who is not necessarily trying to be a DP, I'm always looking for people to work with. And the DP is a person who brings your idea to like life. Yeah. And it's usually like a male thing. Like it's usually men holding the cameras. But I feel like the DP role is very feminine. It's almost like the woman, like the carrier now. Hmm. Um, and as a director, it almost feels a little bit more masculine because I'm kind of telling you. You know, anyway, that's just like a thought I randomly had. But yeah, looking, looking um, and trying to assemble a group of folks to be like, hey, come spend like 72 consecutive hours with me in the woods doing weird stuff. You know, like, I mean, seriously, depending huh. on what the movie is, you know, so you really do have to kind of have an understanding. You don't have to know everything about these people, but you got to trust them and you got to like, like whatever it is that you're asking them to bring. And that has been, um, that's new for me. It's not. It's not totally foreign because in my festival work, we do that, right? Like my digital media person is doing her job. My graphic designer is doing her job. We all come together. We have our conversations. We go our separate ways every, yeah. you know, summer. We know we're going to come together and do our thing. So it's a, it's been a bit of a crossover, but I think because I'm working with new people for the most part, it's been like, oh, this is all about relations. Like I, I have to learn how to talk to people. I have to learn how to discern who's actually here for me or like who just wants to be you know like it's it's a lot of relational work that I don't I'm like is there a class for this you know like in in school they oh you know the pictures and this and that but the actual pulling the shit off that's interpersonal soft skill yeah it's it's execution I, I encountered that with this like you know five years and doing it I used to be very in the whole thing 
you know, exchanging every email. Now it's as simple as, yo, here's the link. Here's all the stuff that I need from you. Bing, bang, boom. Versus, you know, which frees me up that I'm not having to hold someone's hand of, please do the interview with me. It's just like, if you want to do it, cool. It's, I, yeah. I mean, it's very, it's very like dating, you know, it's like if I, if, if I, after a while you want, you want to see that person like playing with you, you know, it's like, oh, you don't actually want to make this. You just want to talk about making this. Yeah. I or mean, you do you want to make this, but like, I need you to like slow down, you know, like it's, it's a very intimate dance making anything with other people. 100%. And this is all new to me as I touched on like newish in that, you know, two thirds of my time being a podcaster and doing doing this sort of thing was insular was my own group of friends. I already knew what their strengths are kind of as you were, you were touching. I know what I can get from you. This is what you do. These are your habits. Mm-hmm. Whereas and I always describe this podcast as blind dating with artists and mm-hmm. you, know, you get on there, you're not sure. And there's a habit where folks will get on. Don't give me any context. Their artist <laughs> is different. They're, they don't have any talking points or anything they really want to discuss. And, you know, as we talked a little bit before getting started, some people just want the opportunity to chat, which is great. But I, I can't just improv the whole thing. So it's like trying to figure out what that balance is. Then there are some folks, not a lot, but it's a percentage enough that they'll grab a slot and then don't show up. And Ooh. I put in an hour to two hours worth of research. So I don't get that time. Right. Back. Oh, and man. Is sort of sort of that thing in, in preparation, because, you know, as you were saying earlier, you know, you like people who are structured, you like people who have like their their stuff in order. I try to at least do my side of it. And when folks such as yourself, guests come on and they make my job easier. I look like I'm more talented. Than I'm actually you know, just like here, just kind of. I mean, you, you need other people to make you look good. Again, it's just like I. <laughs> It's so funny. I've always been very introverted and I've always kind of questioned if I was good with people. And I think this is because I'm comparing myself to my family and I come from a very like jovial family for the characters. I'm like the least funniest person in my family. And then I'll meet people and they're like, oh, my God, you're hilarious. And I'm like, what? Like, (laughs) but it's like, oh, okay. these people, I think because I relate, I relate to people how I relate to my family. Which, you know, I don't know if that's good or bad, But, (laughs) but it has made filmmaking like that much more interesting and I'm, I'm discovering the type of filmmaker I am and what my strengths are and where I should be because that's not always going to be necessary for a certain project and sometimes it's about like becoming discerning you know and not saying yes to every invitation and not following up with every person you need and just being like so again people two different people told me about this and I've been out of the podcast loop for a while um I just listen to astrology videos on YouTube <laughs> like <laughs> You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an amateur astrologer, but I listen to like the bullshit astrology ones because they just choose your own adventure, like lullabies for adults. Um, and you know, it's just a lot going on. So I don't really want to know the news, but I am talking about art all the time in my program and in the work that I'm trying to do. So I'm like, I like, I, when I find people that can actually conversate about yeah. art and not just in a superficial, like, this is cool, this is cool, but how do you feel about it? You know, right. like that's when I'm like, oh, okay. I could do this for a couple of hours. Oh yeah, and um, and, and this is this is my attempt to string everything together. You were touching on family, you were touching <laughs> on projects, and so in an effort to be full circle, let's move towards the current ro- work and let's discuss my mother, the clown. What is it about, and why did you decide to make the film? So, my mother, the clown, is about a uh, serially un, un, unemployed, underemployed millennial named Nina Hamilton. <laughs> whose elderly clown of a mother, Silly Sheila, is injured on the job. She's a pizza sign twirler. Um, And so Nina is forced to figure out, you know, how to pay bills. She's recently moved back in her house as a a 30-year-old. So it's already enough that I live at home. It's like, damn, now my mother not in, like, what I'm going to do, you know? Um, And so without giving out too much, it's just like a social realist comedy. It's just a slight exaggeration of what the past four years have been like for me. It stars my actual mother, Sheila Gaskins, and my actual sister as Nina Hamilton. Um, it was shot in my house. <laughs> and again, it is like the critical fabulation of family lore. Like my mother is a comedian. I grew up watching her perform on stages. I grew up watching her be a bag lady, which is a type of clown. Yeah. yeah I know yeah. about I know about like clowns in a real way. Like, you know, like she we like we take art very seriously in my house. Um, but I think the fact that we are in West Baltimore and we're unassuming black folks, is like, huh? Um, 
yeah, I mean, it's it, it's just a project that came to me when I was crying over a breakup at my graduate assistant job in the winter, which was the the cage production cage of UMBC. And I'm literally cleaning cameras and I'm just like, I just got my student loans because I totally did not. It didn't make I I realized like, oh, I can still get student loans as a grad student. Yeah. So I got those all at once. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and my friends who went to like Tish and stuff like that, like, you know, film school, you make films every year. That's what you take the loans off with. Like you make a film. And I'm like, oh, even though I'm not necessarily in a program that is like dedicated to film, it's a lot more studio based art and just talking about your work. I was like, I'm gonna, let me see if I can make a film real quick. And it happened. And a lot of the connections and the people I work with are folks whose work I knew from managing a festival for seven years. And so much of filmmaking is just like, oh, I like you. I'm going to work with you one day when I get the money. <laughs> it's all speculative. And in this moment, I was like, bet, I got the money. Like, let me let me talk to people who do this. And not everyone was able to see it all the way through, but a lot of people, like, delivered me to the folks who could help me, and that was really helpful. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's a real film in a time where I think people are being disillusioned with, like, celebrity and wealth and this shit is hard outside. You know, like, people are paying for groceries on layaway like it's just Love. it's a real time and so we need to see art that reflects our time so that we don't feel even crazier than what we already are it's been a way for me to talk about what COVID has taken from me it's been a way for me to kind of you know interrogate what it means to be a daughter I don't know that that's something that folks get to talk about like a, a coming of age stories when you're already of age coming of age is kind of like between 15 and 22 it's like no no as long as you, you know, we're always all coming of age and not every story about, you know, family has to center on young children. Some of us have family well into, you know, or fam some of us have a familiar dynamic where we are still seen as a child, even if we're an adult. Right. And a lot of us, I think more than anything coming into my thirties, especially post COVID, so many of my friends who were either missing parents because they had recently lost parents or became parents themselves were like, I need to see work about that. You know, everything is about getting married and getting rich, but it's like, sometimes it's just about surviving Christmas, you know, like sometimes it's just about surviving, visiting your grandmother. Like I kind of need more content about black families. And this is my like submission to that canon. No, I, I, I appreciate that. I love that. And, you know, I love that you touched on it as a, as a comedy and that, it has, I, I had a conversation um, maybe a couple of years ago with um, a filmmaker who was working on an HBO show and it was shot in Chicago, you know, so shot the, the show Southside. And we were talking about it and he, and I'd asked him, I was like, so in having something that's real, that's representative, that has a lot of black folks and is in a quote unquote black city in sort of Southside Chicago. I was like, you know, we, we were talking about him having a really cool conversation as we rap and we close out. He's like, man, I want to see some comedy come out of Baltimore. He's like, oh, I want wow. to more of that. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I was just like, I, I have a few ideas and I like that we're moving in that direction, specifically, you know, what you're describing with your work. It's, it's, it's relatable. It is, you know, especially with the family component, like those are the stories that really interest me and then having something that's topical and recent and, and, and it's just, it just relates and it hits on, on those levels. So when you're, you're thinking about sort of this, this recent history and it has those, those elements that are challenging, those elements that are like, man, Ooh, we're covering this. What are the considerations that, that you're making to say like, all right, does this fit in here? Should I take this out? Should I maybe use this story that I know and I'm very intimate with, but it didn't directly happen to me in this order and or my, my family in this order in this way? Um, I mean, I'm a very resourceful person. So it was just like, what do we have? What can we do? You know, like the script that I wrote is not the film that you all will see sure. because we just had to make real decisions in real time. Um, I think the most, the, the toughest considerations for me at the time, my sister was maybe four months pregnant. Mm. And so I was just like, she has like she she's in every scene you know she carries the film and I'm, i was so nervous like oh my god this she's pregnant like this is hard it's so long like what are we going to do but she just came through and like really amazed me and i think because this is my first film and i'm just really focused on seeing it through right seeing it through to distribution because it's so hard to make films like it i can't even i can't get into is something good or bad does it exist 
Like right. that's that's the title of this chapter. Like because it is so hard to, for reasons that are beyond our control. I mean, we we know those reasons. I don't have to go into that. But like for me, it's like how do we how do we make this thing? And so let me know if I'm even answering the question. I feel like I'm oh, going on a tangent. But it's just I don't know. It's one of those things where like the considerations were, can I do this? I have recently uh, just recovered from being sick. I had a really great graduate advisor, Sarah Sharp, who kind of just was real honest. I dropped this place so you can just survive. Right. Because there's no way I would have like did well in school and, and pulled this film off. And it just, you know, the film is about survival. Like, you know, the 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 Nina is presented with an opportunity via a, a, a um, reality TV show. Right. Um, that is just obscene and absurd because these reality TV shows are ridiculous. <laughs> like they are just, and so. And writing that, I'm just like, this is liter- like a literal nightmare, but this does look like the only way out, right? Like, because the circumstance, you have a mom for a clown, that's a spectacle. Like, you can't, she's not about to go and get a job at a bank, you know? Like, you really kind of have to just surrender yeah. and accept your circumstances and figure it out. Um, and so this is a short, but I think it'll be a web series if it does well, because there's a whole world that can come out of this. But just kind of get into a place of acceptance. It's like, this is what I have. I can't write a movie about, you know, being admired by 15 different people or being rich. Like that's not, I don't got that. Like I got a, I got a mother who is a genuine artist who is willing to do very strange things on camera. I got a sister who can show up on time and say some lines. I got a cousin who know how to hold a camera. Got another cousin that can dance. You know, and I happen to have built somewhat of a platform for myself. So I need to stop being afraid of being judged for being good or bad. Because it's tough. It's hard to go from being the judger to being like, actually, guys, it's my turn. This is something that I've done. I hope you don't hope you don't hate it. But I'm like, well, if you hate it, if it's bad, well, we all going to find out. You know, I'm going to find out as soon as y'all find out if it's actually good. But it shouldn't be the, that shouldn't be my determinant thing. Right. And that's, that kind of goes back to what it means to be an artist in a society. Yeah. Like one bad attempt at an art thing should not make or break you. And if it does, that speaks to like a culture at large. And I come from a school of, I grew up in Woonwork under Mama K and Mama Rashida. When we are practicing our theater and we are dancing, you you want a floor until you get it. So yeah, my considerations was what I have, this is what I got. I'm going to put it out there. Hopefully it does well. And I get to learn what I do as a filmmaker. Like I get to learn like, okay, this is a strength for me. I did this really well. I did this poorly, but this ain't my, this is the beginning. Like this ain't even a hard story. I want to tell. There are some stories that like, I know will wreck me if I get the chance to tell them, but like, because I've surrendered to my circumstances and who I am, which is an artist, what else I'm going to do? And the life, like the world kind of have just, it just opens up to me, you know, when I show up, like I'm an artist this is what I do. People like give me stuff. I'm like, okay, yeah, you're an artist. This is what you do, you know? And I watch people, you know, watch my work and they get things from that. I'm like, I don't even know if I plan that. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like once, you know, once it's out in the world, it, it doesn't even belong to you anymore. And so like, you know, my mother plan, once it exists out in the world, I don't know that I'll identify so deeply with the things that come up. Um, and that film, I hope, I hope it's cathartic for me in that way, but we'll see. It also could just go left and destroy my family. I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> That's a great, great spot for us to kind of, I, w- I want to have one more comment <laughs> before I move into these rapid fire questions. And okay. yeah, I, I think, you know, sort of the resourcefulness, the the courage, you know, when we, we put these things out there, I, I think each time that we work on, I, I'm just going to say macroly speaking, the reps, whatever it is that you're mm-hmm. doing, hours in, whether yep. it's that, what have you, you know, it's it's courage in putting it out there because not everyone is doing it and it's hard to get some of these things made. It's hard to, you know, and I'm always happy that things exist. That's that's the mm-hmm. thing I, I look for. And, you know, I place I play on Reddit a little bit sometimes, just getting a take on how people feel about certain things, specifically things in, in, in Baltimore, and just seeing some of the takes and people are very, very snobbish in it. And almost as if they don't want to see things made. And it's just like, look, this is an attempt, like. And it's the thing that my partner says, because she, she's, mm-hmm. she's a bit older. She has a background in stage in English. And she was just like, where's yours? Whenever someone has that really tight. That's what my mother say all the time. And you know what's funny, right? The yeah. thing about taste is like, it's so political. Mm-hmm. Like good and bad is such a, it's really an indicator of who you are, what you value, where you come from. I, um, I was introduced to a text called Towards an Imperfect Cinema 
Mm. The the author is eluding me right now, but it was basically about Cuban revolutionary filmmakers saying like, hey, we reject European cinema because we are trying to be different. So our entire film scene needs to be different. We don't need to be replicating what they're doing over there if we say we are who we are over here. And so the taste thing in Baltimore and like what's good and what's bad. I grew up in stage plays, you know, like my uncle was Baltimore's Tyler Perry, Howard G, you know, mm-hmm. and like, is it my cup of tea? I'm different. But do I respect the craft and the grind? And like, I was working the spotlight, you know, Right. this is my time to like use what I got from him even and put my little twist on it. And it's funny looking at my work now, I'm like, dang, that's my uncle Howard. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But like, yeah, you know, like that's how art is. It's just communication. It's just people telling stories around a campfire, you know, like. And so if you sit on the sidelines judging other people's stories, either become a true critic, you know, and learn how to like talk about what's happening and what's not. Cause I'm I'm not like nobody can say anything. No, we all need some judgment and correction and consideration. But like usually when people are hating from the sidelines, it's because they're too afraid to like put their own thing in. And it's like I can't even that holds no weight. I can only be judged. Like, you know, you can't compare where you, you can't compete where you don't compare. Like mm-hmm. I can only hear folks who are doing the thing. Now, you might be better than me, but that's that's relative. You know, you better than me right now. Yeah. You might not be better than me five years and whatever it is that we do. I love so, that. So, again, you're... I'm, I, I grew up, I'm not the only one like myself. I'm yeah. surrounded by people who are making great art. I'm just the one who happens to have like time and attention and energy right now. And that's not even always the thing, you know? So I'm like, bet I got the baton. I'm gonna do my little run. And then the next person might take it and maybe hopefully I can benefit from that. But ultimately, I just I like to live in a world where things exist. And, and like you said. Yeah. So I got I got three rapid fire questions for you before we close out here. Um, the first one, because, you know, I've, I've been typing as we've been talking, you know, like I said, I, as people start saying things, I'm like, OK, that's a better question. So the first one <laughs> I got to go off with since you're, you're out here studying, what's your astrological sign? Oh, are we talking tropical or sidereal? Um, she hit me with both. I mean, I'm, I'm you know. <laughs> what you know about Sidereal? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to stunt right That's now. Like, uh, uh, well, I was born in December. So tropically, I'm a sun Sagittarius. Sidereally, I'm a sun Scorpio. But I um, identify the most with being a Cancer rising. Your okay. rising sign is how you read your natal chart, which is how you get into predictive astrology. Look, I, all I know mm-hmm. is it's January 20th. That's all I get for myself. All of the other stuff, I don't know. I'm just some... Yeah. Cancer rising is about family. So I'm like, yeah, pretty on a note. Um, You mentioned this. Reality TV. Favorite reality TV show. You know, I kind of hate reality TV. My mom and my sister watch it all the time. And so I'm kind (laughs) of always surrounded by it. But it kind of, all right. So my actual favorites, 90 Day Fiance, like the whole universe. (laughs) Love after lockup if I'm feeling very like messy because sometimes it's too sad. Couples therapy on a high end, like if I feel like being cultured or if I meet somebody and I want them to judge me, you know, I'm watching couples therapy. Couples therapy is good. Um, and on the low end, like I just need to like zombie out, binge Love Island. That's good. That's good. On occasion, I watch. And it's it's because of one of my friends. We're we're both like larger guys, and we just want to like look at sort of how we measure up. And it's not like, because ultimately we both end up feeling super sad. If, mm-hmm. if you end up watching like My 600 Pound Life and you'll see like mm-hmm. clips of this dude just ordering everything and then singing to the tasty cakes. I'm like, yo, you are wild. But then it's just, wow. like, you're, you gotta get this surgery because this is, this is happening. So it's like, you get, you know, 90% sadness in that one moment of like, Yo, I I like cheese fries, but I ain't singing the tasty cakes. This is why mm-hmm. you you feel a little bit better about yourself and then bad afterwards. So I'm like, eh, I don't watch that as much. I mean, we all watch reality TV shows that feel better than people. That's literally even Housewives. We watch Housewives to judge people that we think are wealthy. So true. Okay, this is the last one I got for you. Um, if you had a theme song, right? You know, coming to the stage, we got Nia Hampton. What is the song that you're coming out to? <laughs> I think today it would be Name It, Claim It by the Clark Sisters. Okay. It really could be anything, but it's Juneteenth, and I am a spiritualista. Like, I have an ancestor altar, and I believe in prayer. I'm not necessarily Christian, but I believe in, like, spiritual practices. It's just a way to kind of 
keep ourselves grounded. And I just had a good crying session to some gospel music. And I, there was a, a tweet, I think, like, you know, when a black person listens to gospel music, they're about to change their whole life. So, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of raising, I think we got six. I need six more to get this post-production finished. Yeah. So I really have to be on some, like, I'm going to get it. It's mine. I have to talk. To, like, I really have to tap in and become a character and understand it. What's for me is what's for me. And what's for me is this money right now. So I can do my thing. So gospel music, you know, it's going to get you together. Clark Sisters, like... Everything about them is just like, oh my God, yes. Thank you, and um, and it makes it makes a lot of sense. And this is another one of those sort of post segue segues. Um, so there's two things I want to do as we close out here. One, I want to thank you for for spending some time with me. It's been great chatting. Um, I feel like this I've, has been really fun. I like what you said about like uh, what artist blind dates. It's like yeah, <laughs> and you know, I I give a good first date. The other ones <laughs> not so much, but I'm a great first date. We have a good time. So. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's funny. Um, and for the second part, um, I, I want to do the shameless plug piece. Where can folks support the film? Where can folks like support sort of the completion of, of the film? And where can they fo follow you? Website, social media, all of that good stuff. You know, elevator pitch. The floor is yours. Right. So you can follow us on Instagram at Glowing Pain Studio. Or you can find the film festival on Instagram at BF. S Film Fest or our website bffilmfest.com. Uh, we're hosting this campaign through Seed and Spark. So if you go to seedandspark.com and search "My Mother the Clown" or "My Name Mia Hampton," it will come up. There's also the tiny URL http semicolon forward slash forward slash tiny URL dot com forward slash clown mom. So even on Facebook, like like Film Supremacy Film Fest, that'll come up or Glow and Pain Studio, that'll come up. So for Nia Hampton, I am Rob Lee saying that there's art, culture, and community in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. Mm -hmm.